when you look at the Quran, certainly the number of men, specific human men who are mentioned, is greater than women. And that is simply the case. And at the same time, the Quranic account of stories that are uh, sacred stories, sacred history, stories that are similar to stories that one finds in the Bible, are very different from the stories one finds in the Bible and that they are generally not so concerned with detail. You find far fewer names in general in the Quran. You find um, no real dates. You find no real time periods. You find very sketchy geography as compared to what you find, let's say, in the Torah. And uh, women, there is only one woman who is actually specifically named in the Quran, and that is the Virgin Mary. She's given her own chapter, or titles a, a chapter in the Quran. A great deal is revealed and, and uh, related about Mary in the Quran. Uh, and she is given her name, a personal name. The other women that appear in the Quran appear in relation to men. So the mother of Moses, the sister of Moses, the wife of Pharaoh, the wife of Noah, the wife of Lot. But the fact that they are not given names, the fact that they are named in relation to men should not be taken to mean that they are either not independent moral actors or that they are insignificant. They are not. They play important roles in the Quran. Now, yesterday, when Hamza Yusuf was talking about the prophets, he re uh, broached briefly this issue about prophet, female prophets in Islam. And he said that while most people say that you can't have female prophets in Islam, some writers have argued that you can, and that he personal, personally believes that you can, and that Mary is the best example of that. And in many ways, Mary would seem to fit very clearly a definition of prophet. But I think it's important to point out that prophecy in the Islamic view is not just about God speaking to you. God speaks to a lot of people in the Quran. God speaks to the mother of Moses in the Quran. It's not just God speaking to you that makes you a prophet. Prophets in Islam have a public vocation. The very word nebi means someone who brings a warning. So you have a public mission. And in Islamic thought, the, the reason that was given for why you do not have female prophets is because this kind of a public vocation, getting up and standing and preaching in front of people, a very new and sometimes radical message, was not considered a job that would be appropriate for women or safe for women or effective if it was done by women. But nonetheless, again, women play very important roles in sacred history. If we look at the case of uh, the Virgin Mary herself, we read the story about uh, essentially the Annunciation, her conception, her miraculous and virgin conception, of Jesus and the birth story. Here, it's clear, as one of the people in my group pointed out, there is no Joseph. There is no husband. Which not only means there isn't someone to accompany Mary, to comfort Mary, to help Mary, there's also no one to give her, in a sense, cover. Here she is, a young girl who's been secluded alone in the temple, and suddenly she comes with a child. This was not just all right when Mary was living. You know, you didn't just say, hey, mom, look. Um, guess what I brought home? Um, you know, th this was something that what could have gotten her killed. This was something that could have been a capital offense. And yet, not only does she bravely give birth to Jesus, but she is instructed by God to, to observe a fast of silence, to do exactly what prophets are, the opposite of what prophets are told to do, which is to speak. She's told to vow a fast of silence. So that when she comes back with the child to her family, and they immediately think the worst and accuse her. She doesn't break her vow even to defend herself. She just points to the child and he defends her by speaking, even as an infant, about who he is. So I think 
that this idea is important to keep in mind when we think about um, Mary. But that does not in any way uh, lessen her, her vocation or her importance in the sacred history of this particular prophet from the point of view of Islam. One of the things that is interesting, the story that was not um, in the uh, literature that we had from yesterday is it found in the thir third chapter of the Quran where it talks about how Mary gets devoted to the temple in the first place. And it says that her mother promised that the child that was within her womb, she would dedicate to God, meaning she would dedicate it to the temple. And she's naturally assuming she's going to have a male. People don't dedicate females to the temple. You dedicate a male to the temple. And then when the child is born and it's Mary, the mother is astonished. And the response is, we know what we have done. The male is not like the female. This is God's response. We know the male is not like the female. But in the very next line it says, and the Lord accepted her with full acceptance. And so although there is this distinction, there is this separation, male and female are real categories. They're not conglomerations of, of, of social up bringing, you know, as people think. They're real from the point of view of the Quran, and yet at the same time, it is no barrier to her being dedicated to the temple and having this particular vocation. So I think that that's, that one story together is very emblematic of the Quran's view, as I'm going to talk about, about women, that on the one hand, from a spiritual point of view, in the eyes of God, in terms of their devotion to God and their spiritual vocation, they are equal. But socially, this distinction between male and female is not something you can ignore. It is significant and it has repercussions. Um, when we look at some of the other women that we talked about, uh, again, in the uh, study groups from last time, the wife of Pharaoh. The wife of Pharaoh is the one who adopts Moses. Pharaoh is probably uh, the most irredeemably evil character. Um, in the Quran. Not only is he an oppressor, but he also claims to be a god himself. He commits this absolute crime. And this is a woman who is married to Pharaoh, but she takes in Moses, and she's represented in the Quran as being very pious. And she is rewarded for that. In fact, there is an Islamic tradition that says the four greatest women who ever lived are the Virgin Mary, the wife of Pharaoh, Khadija, the wife of the Prophet Muhammad, and Fatima, his daughter. So married to this, this unbelievably evil character, she becomes one of the four greatest women. And I think this story is very clear also when you look at the story of the, the negative examples of the wife of Lot and Noah, is that although women are identified as the wife of so-and-so, the mother of so-and-so, their moral destiny is something they make themselves and completely independently of their husbands. They act independently as independent moral agents. 